Hello, this is the voice of Stuart Pierce, and welcome to my series of Deep Dialogues. These are vital conversations I engage in with global soul stewards from all over the planet, providing us with vital understandings about how we can create a new hierarchy of values to help us evolve into a brave new world. I hope you enjoy, and thanks for listening. Namaste to darling Patricia, as to you all gathering wherever you may be all around the world. Um, and, you know, if I may, just for a moment before I introduce this wonderful, wonderful lady that we have with us this evening, or this afternoon, or this morning, whenever you're listening, is just to spend a moment in reflection of the fact that this is Patriot's Day in the United States of America because it is 9-11. So we can hold in our hearts the wonderment of what has taken place in the creation of peace and indeed where there are any departments in the central organizing principles of the established orders or indeed any cultures that are in dismay, may the love of our hearts spread into those cultures so that we create a beautiful, loving network of grace around the planet. Just holding that in your heart for a moment. Thank you, darling. So we have a real treat in this very remarkable lady because she is an embodiment of the high priestess and spiritual warrior, as you will hear as we move through this. So who is Patricia? Let me introduce you through her bio. So Patricia Corey is an internationally acclaimed author and thought leader who has been sharing wisdom about the human condition and the enlightenment of civilization for over three decades. Patricia is a systems buster, a freedom fighter, a warrior for truth, justice, and the liberation of humanity. So beware, a former host of the popular BBS radio show Beyond the Matrix, she has been a guest on hundreds of radio and TV programs, including CNN and Coast to Coast. Her 13 published books have been translated into 22 world languages and include The Cosmos of the Soul, Atlantis Rising, No More Secrets, No More Lies, and The Emissary. Patricia's entire body of work was cancelled by her previous publisher, yet these classic books are now re-released directly by Patricia's team via Amazon. They're a classic, they are classical spiritual material processes that have endured for almost three decades, and they are just as fresh and relevant as they were when they were initially in print. Her new book, Hacking the Code, which is extraordinary, <laughs> subtitled The Conspiracy to Steal the Human Soul, was launched in 2022 and soared to a number one ranking on Amazon. Patricia's writing is absolutely exquisite. Although she's dealing with so many constructs, so many very amazing concepts that are both you know, classical and durable in terms of the length and the history of the human species going all the way back into former civilization. Patricia always writes with such ease, and so it's very easy to bask in the quality of her thinking transposed into writing. So the book is now out. She is a true spirit leader. Patricia is weaving her own music into the souls of her readers, calling upon humankind to wake up and take on its true role of leadership for the preservation of the magnificence of our planet. Patricia Corey, welcome. Thank you. What a beautiful introduction. Well, bless you. Thank you for being with me in Deep Dialogues. Now, I know that our title is Atlantis Rises, but perhaps we should start, maybe work anti-chronologically, to start with the hacking code, or rather hacking the code, the God code, and, um, and then we'll move backwards. The impetus that drew you, the inspiration that drew you into writing Hacking the God Code was, is that something you, you can impart? Absolutely. I have no secrets, no more lies. <laughs> I, 
I saw where we were headed with the mandates that were being imposed on civilization and the manipulation of DNA, which is, is, has been a thread in all of my works, all of the channel material, always talk about the human DNA. Hmm. And so I realized that this was the moment when we were going to be facing giving up the sovereignty. People would be, would be making a choice if they were giving away their DNA, that they were actually bowing to obedience, slavery, fear, whatever those elements are that cause someone to hand over their sovereign soul and saying, yeah, here's my DNA, here's my blood, here's my take it, take it, take it. And so I felt an, an urgency to talk about how to, first of all, stand in sovereignty, say no to the, um, the masters, and I don't mean masters as you and I intend, and also to be uh, to bring forward what they're doing with AI and how that plays a part of it. So I've been also talking about AI quite a long time, but how this uh, stealing of the human DNA, the process of people turning it in for finding out what nationality their roots are and the ancestry system, all of that was to collect human DNA that they could manipulate and alter and begin to merge us with artificial intelligence. And this is my, I don't know how to call it. Uh, to say that it's a wake up call is a, is a sort of an understatement because it is a smash in the face. <laughs> Get serious now. This is, there's no more time to uh, play around with this. Now is the time to understand this. And then if you choose the alternative to bowing and saying, uh, I obey, that's your choice. But for those who don't, those who stand in their sovereignty, then I wanted to create a guidebook mm. on how to do that. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. And so I, th I feel we receive the context of your thesis from what you've just shared. Uh, maybe we could move into the substance of, if you could mention three things that you feel are the saving principles because obviously there is a certain bleak vision that we've just created by naming what is going on for those people that perhaps aren't as fully aware as you and I may be. Not that that's any judgment, it's just simply that's a discernible reality. Three things that are saving graces that you feel would be useful to us. Well, like most of my books, it begins with the problematic situation. And then it moves into, I'm glad, I'm, I know you haven't gotten there yet, the way to cope with, alter, and raise the frequency of those yeah. problems. Yeah. And so my thesis in this book is that we, we do know that everything is consciousness, everything is energy, everything is waves, etc. We know that the frequency of fear is very low. We know that the frequency of love is very high. And we have been shown this, and I do mention this in the book, by the wonderful Emoto, Dr. Emoto, who showed, I mean, his work has reached everybody on the planet, it seems, you know, the love uh, that goes into the water molecule and how it manifests in perfection, the six-sided um, star. Mm and how when it sent fear and hate and all and he used to, he used to say I, I couldn't bear sending that low vibration into the water but i had to do it it was an experiment and uh how it would collapse and decay and etc and so using that principle my point is that we first of all we can repair any damage that is done to us i truly believe that and even though we know that in uh, gotta be careful what I say here, uh, that in some of the new medicine, there are systems that are synthetic in nature that are changing and altering the DNA and the uh, purveyors of such medicines are admitting it now. They Originally they didn't admit it, but now they're admitting it. Of course it is, it's a messenger that's sending a new 
message into the human DNA. So, you know, my message is don't take such medicines. But if you have, and a lot of people have and now are very fearful, I believe, I'm sure you agree, that the we have the capacity mm. to alter even that. Absolutely. But it requires immense focus, mm. incredible determination, and acute uh, intent. Yeah. yeah. So that we yeah. can actually override the overwrite mm. and command the mm. DNA to return to its pure form. Bearing mm. in mind, Stuart, and this might be a little lengthy, so bear with me, that in earlier books, I've talked quite at length about how we were 12 stranded beings at mm. the onset of Homo sapiens, mm. and that many of these strands were scrambled. Mm. Um, which is, is is very lengthy and goes into my earlier works, but that we are that that, that we are uh, a double helix structure in our DNA mm. de denies the fact that we've got ten strands of matter of DNA matter floating around, scrambled around, which they call junk. Mm. I think they don't know we're calling it junk now. They're calling it non-specific identi identity. <laughs> <laughs> So I am bringing forward in this book that, yes, here are the problems. Look at them. Don't be afraid to look at them because the vibe of fear is the problem. So mm -hmm. look at it all. Let's talk about it all, which is how I live my life. And then look at these solutions. Know that there are ways to override anything, anything that comes into you when you have the clarity of intent and focus. And also know that whoever, again, I've got to be careful here, the medicine is focused on the two strands of dna well guess what they don't know what to do with the other 10. Mm -hmm. so as when you start understanding the sacred geometry mm -hmm. the magic uh, that that is is held within that your body and that those strands are mm -hmm. waiting to be reassembled and realigned then you mm -hmm. know you've got 10 strands more of dna that can't be blemished that you can then utilize to turn the wheel on whatever's been so this is a very big part of the book and the second half of the book talks about there are uh, meditations mm. to activate the th the third strand which creates the tetrahedral mm. uh, sacred form in the dna and then again the six or the star Merkaba in the dna yeah. So did I answer that, or am I missing a few more? No, it's really absolutely brilliant, 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 brilliant. Um, I, I I just wanted to bring in that that essence of the light, you know, because the picture is quite bleak, as we all know, and so I'm always a, gr a great believer in moving back into the vibrational frequency of the freedom of love, and I, I just wanted those constructive messages. So you've done it very beautifully. I hope you agree those of you who are listening in. <laughs> and so you can hear that actually what Patricia's doing in this really inestimable work, that she's drawing on cosmological intelligence and talking about it or writing about it in really grounded terms so that it's highly practicable for everyone on this planet hacking the God code. And there is this quote, I loathe quoting things to people who have written, you know, but you've written, you write so beautifully and I just wanted to share with my own voice. Coiled within the nucleus of every cell, it is an absolute, is an absolute seed of life. It is the supra intelligent architecture of all biology and inevitably all dimensional aspects that contribute to the complexity of any and every living being anywhere and everywhere life is manifested in creation. It defines every single aspect of all organic forms that exist in the cosmos of the soul and drives the evolutionary progression of all organic substances and beings. Now, can you feel the hope in that? everybody that's that's <laughs> you know because as soon as we start to move into what's really going on as patricia has just uh, enumerated very clearly we're, we're onto something very extraordinary now you and i know that 
although this is happening uniquely in this time, that this is actually an echo from previous times, which you've already addressed very beautifully. And I'd love to therefore step backwards into the other aspects of the body of your work, and particularly when you were touched in the early 90s by the Syrian high command and how they provided, and I'm not talking about the country Syrian, I'm talking about this, the, the planet Sirius. Uh, and it happened when you weren't necessarily looking for it. Definitely. I was in England doing a chromo, I, I, I've been a healer for 40 years, so I was doing a, a very intensive chromotherapy uh, program in a college there. Uh, and I dreamt that I was flying over Stonehenge. And when I looked down, I saw this enormous spiral and uh, woke up, depicted this on a napkin because I was, it was the middle of the night. And the next day we went to Glastonbury with a group and I saw this exact formation on a poster on the wall. And at that time I didn't know about, it was 1997, I didn't know very much about crop circles at that time. So I, I, I dumbfounded, I asked her what that was and she said, uh, the bookstore person, she said, why that's the latest crop circle in Stonehenge. I said, I, I thought crop circles were burn marks in Russia by supposed UFOs. She goes, no, that's a 151 Fibonacci sequence formation that's come at, down in, a, in the middle of the day. And you've been called, because I told her I dreamt it. So long story short, I, I got to, oh, a big important thing was in the dream, I heard a voice say, uh, pay attention. I was flying over it, right? Pay attention. This is a lock on point for interdimensional intelligence. And it's going to be very important for you wake up now, you have work to do. So I woke up the next few days later, the professor, one of the professors said, you're not here for this course. You've got to get into that crop circle. That's what that's about. And I'm going to take you. So when he did, I basically just fell into it. I, I, I almost collapsed and I started spinning and spinning. And I looked down and I, I couldn't see my feet. They were disappearing. And my legs were disappearing. I was hearing sound, music. And the next thing I know, I was floating around the galaxy. And that was my encounter with these beings. Yeah. And so uh, I know that I was being attuned in that process because I was in a galaxy very, very far away. And as soon as I got back to Rome a few days later, I started channeling, immediately started channeling the books. And I have to say, Stuart, I don't know about you, but I really didn't want to use my psychic gifts as a medium, as a channel, I, I, I didn't, I was, it didn't appeal to me. I didn't like the idea of mediumship, but you know, it just kept coming and coming and coming and coming. And I understood the vibration of it was of the highest intention, which I think anyone who reads the Cosmos of Soul knows. And so I said, okay, I'm in service. Yes. And that was 1997 and, and uh, here I am still today. There are so many parallels between your experience and my experience. And in fact, afterwards, I'm going to send you a photograph of a crop circle to the south of the tour, Glastonbury tour, which is the crop circle that appeared overnight on August the 16th, 1987, when I was in the small town with a friend who just opened a crystal store who said to me, you're really good at these fast readings. Why don't you come? We'll have fun. It's an event called the Harmonic Convergence. I was completely ignorant. Wow. Okay. You were in Harmonic Convergence? You were in Glastonbury? No, I actually went. Oh, and, how wonderful. And, you know, was reading during the morning. Of course, of course, that small town had the world and his wife there, you know. And I was reading all morning and felt exhausted. So I climbed the tour to meditate. And that's wow. when I met the angels of Atlanta. The 12 angels of Atlantis came to me, uh, who I've been, there, you know, the emissary or propagating their work ever since. However, the following morning, as I was driving away from Glastonbury, I was driving on a southerly road, a road rather, and a crop circle had just occurred. So I took a photograph of it. Of course, I had to use it in the first oracle that I created for the Angels of Atlantis. So I'm with you completely. There's such relativity about the awakening principles that have been there for you. 
um, as indeed for me, although I'm in complete receipt and respect of the fact that this is your own unique experience. I'm just um, very extraordinary without wanting to get sentimental there about is, it. There is a mutuality about it because uh, for people that have, have not been in a crop circle or not had an experience of, of, of it being so important, because a lot of them, I mean, I've been in and out of crop circles for 20 years. I, I, I started going, I stopped going with the vid and up until then I went every year, I brought groups of people in and whatever, but nothing came close to that experience of being in the Julia set that yeah. year. Yeah. It was life altering completely. One of the great life altering moments of my life. And like you, it has an importance. It's a temporary temple and it's mm -hmm. a marker and uh, a, a, a portal opener. It's so many things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I remember sitting in another crop circle somewhere and I was just, I started crying. I had no emotion attached to the tears whatsoever. I was just sitting in, in the lotus position, these tears streaming out of my face. And I could hear the council saying, we need to feel human emotion. Mm. And it got louder. We want to feel human emotion. And I was just there for them. And this man was looking at me because he couldn't feel anything. Right. Mm. Mm. And he came over to me and he said, are you okay? I said, yes, I am. And he said, what are you feeling? Like, I want to feel it. And I said, I'm feeling, I couldn't tell him I'm feeling, you know, I'm being a transmitter of energy for, of emotional energy for six dimensional beings. Uh, well, I could have in fact said that, but he was obviously not there, you know, and I said, I'm, I'm letting whatever I, I'm letting something flow through me. The, the crop circle is creating a, a, a field of, energy that's moving me emotionally and he sat down in front of me and went i'd give anything to feel that mm. i said well lie down close your eyes and stop trying to feel something mm. and uh but you know i i just thought in that moment i mean i was there for in that particular moment it was about 20 20 minutes 25 minutes of just gushing i was just soaked mm. i had mm. no personal emotion attached to it and it was mm. the most remarkable experience i don't know if you've ever had one like that where it yes. mine. It wasn't mine at all as mm. just serving for these beings mm. and i'd like to interject something here we aspire to the fifth dimension consciousness we're aspiring to ascension but the council keeps saying you know you are remarkable beings don't forget it's a honor to be homo sapiens on planet earth no matter how difficult it is don't mm. forget it mm. don't bypass it aspiring to be something that you're that that, that you believe is in some mis mm. mystical future because you're going to miss the whole purpose of what you're doing here mm. i think that's an important thing to share that's beautiful absolutely beautiful and it's uh, it's seldom said in the way that you've just imparted it so thank you for that i mean you know the wonderful people who are here many of them know my teachings so they're used to hearing me say it the fact that you know the um how i've been introduced to the substance of the fact that there are 24 intelligent nations within our galaxy um, but of course, we're the only embodied, we're the only beings within body and the other beings with this advanced spiritual technology, advanced light technology, look on us with awe because, and say, how did you do that? It's so extraordinary. <laughs> um, but of course, it's difficult for us to conceive of because we're dealing with intelligent species, in, sentient species that is beyond weight, space and time. And of course, we're so reduced by these heavy, dense energies. Um, and to step, step back further into Atlantis and to perhaps draw together the string of the, the huge body. Ah, oh, there's something else that I want to go into as well, which is what you feel crop circles are. In other words, what creates or how is a crop circle created? Um, just to give a very earthed depiction of the majesty, the magic, and the extraordinariness of what we see with crop circle. And particularly, if I may, just to extrapolate on where you were to receive the body of the information that you've just shared with us, the beginning of what you've just shared with us, meaning in the in Somersetshire, and how 
uh, sorry, Wiltshire, and how powerful that is in terms of the energy between Avebury and Stonehenge. Okay. Yeah. I really uh, love the idea or the fact that you are uh, grounded and want to, to have that information brought in in a grounded way. So I love to uh, walk between the science and the mystical all the time. Yeah. And uh, that is uh, really very helpful in reaching a lot of different kinds of people. So, first of all, we know for sure, studies have been made, that crop circles, about 80% or 90% of them come in in a specific region of England that is, um, has a very high watershed. Um, um, so the earthen ground where they come in, there's a lot of water. It's about 90% of the crop circles are within this space. And it's also primarily within the triangulation, which is Ava Berry, Glastonbury, and uh, Stonehenge. Okay, sacred, sacred land, not to mention the ley lines, of course. And my understanding and what the council has, has confirmed with me is that it's really very simple. Consciousness from higher dimensions determine that the best way to communicate intelligence to any other species is mathematics, ratio, proportion, design, art, creation. So what better way to communicate with a sentient species, communicate in higher intelligence and beauty and love than to uh, put a design into the earth where highly awakened people can reach and of course, they say that it's the simple process of this is sending an electric vib a pulse into the earth and the water, which is magnet, pulls it down, pulls it in and the crop <laughs> fall. Not because of some, I don't believe it's got anything to do with light beings and orbs floating around. I think that's a con. I think that it's just splayed because the force of the water magnetism receiving that electric frequency just pulls it right down. Mm -hmm. And perhaps it pulls it down in a vortex because we know that uh, the energy of, of water and the, how powerful it is when water is free to run in a vortex field. Uh, so yeah. that's what I, I understand. Yeah, so it's, it's electric. And it's water pulling it down, and in the in between is the crop, and that is by design so that people can see it physically and get into it. Yeah, yeah. Because so I remember, uh, did you have this experience? The first crop circle that I I moved into, which must have been oh the early eighties, and when one's looking at it, there is an appearance of a riot of nature. It's, it's slightly chaotic, and then of course when you view, it's a thing of such utter beauty. Yes, <laughs> and it, that's a wonderful paradigm. I always feel, or illustration at least, for the myopia that so many of us um, contrive until we actually have, uh, the, you know, we see through rather than just see surface. And feel. Uh, you're so busy when you when you're a novice getting into crop circles. You're so busy uh, wanting to understand the design, wanting to get the lay of it. Yeah. And when I was guiding people in. In, I was like, we don't know what this is going to look like. It doesn't yeah. matter what it's going to look like, but let's make sure that every step we take entering it, know that the going, the getting yeah. there is yeah. just as important, if not more, than yeah. the being there. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and then hallelujah when you're in a crop circle. Hallelujah, that's all I have to say. <laughs> it's yeah. extraordinary. I, I've never been able to stand on my head, but the first crop circle that I entered, I, I was told, stand on your head, and I did it perfectly. And that's I remember it. I was wearing um, a piece of Larimar around my neck, and I just with a T-shirt. And, of course, standing on my head, it fell into my chin, into almost into my mouth, and it pinged off. <laughs> it literally just yeah. flew through the air. <laughs> many, many unusual phenomena. Um, well, we're really talking about the, to go back to what you were saying earlier about miracles in water and the wonderful Mazuru Emoto, 
which for those of you, I hope you, you grasp the reference that Patricia was making. Miracles in Water, Prof Professor Mazuro Imoto. I think, was, I think it was, I think it's his work, his book is called Messages in Water. Messages in Water. I always think of them as being miraculous. They are. <laughs> um, and how, here we are again talking, talking about a, a landscape that is essentially deep down chalk base. And so the water is not sod, sodden as we know throughout the earth, but it's an extraordinary fertile region. And I understand that within the crop, where the crop articulates its growth, that held within the articulation of where the crop articulates is a body of water that is um, at least, uh, I think it's something like 75% of the overall water that is within the crop. And so the electromagnetic pulsation, I would think possibly, I feel rather, possibly through ultrasonic sound, it has a direct effect. And therefore yes. the crop, as it were, melts to the ground. I mean, I actually have a video, I, I believe it's reasonably legitimate of a crop circle being made. Mm. Is Maybe that the one, like, the light balls? Yeah, the Golden Balls by Golden Ball Hill. Yes, I don't buy that one. <laughs> the great thing about crop circles, and you know, the wonderful Andy Thomas. I don't know if you know him, but he's a yes. wonderful, a very good friend, and you know, wonderful researchers. And he has the um, balance, which I love, to not assume anything. These are the facts that I know, and you know, and in fact, he he's spoken more times to my group and he says this is how Patricia's going to say it and he said you know and and there's nothing wrong with her way and there's nothing wrong with this way and he said the great thing about the crop circle phenomenon is there's something for everyone and nobody has the answer yeah. and that that we are drawn to contemplate it is the magic the wonder of it all because yeah. we 20 30 years now we're watching these crop circles and and I, they are such a vital part of the wake up of humanity. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, tune in, tune in, tune in. Um, and by the way, ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question for Patricia, please do feel free to write it in the comment box. But please don't write an essay. Just write a brief sentence. Um, somebody's written something already. I had a deep energy encounter neath a yew tree. Bless you, Julia, or Julie La. Um, bless you. So, if we could now step back into the waters of Atlantis, they, they who came from the oceans, they who came from the seas, they, they who came from the, the great Atla, from the waters, you have this very close relationship with Atlantis, um, which yes. is seen so beautifully. I mean, I just started rereading, you know, an hour ago, started rereading Atlantis Rising so that I could be steeped in the beauty of your writing. Uh, I find this to be a remarkable because it is such clear, um, such a clear exposition on the whole substance of what the relativity of our consciousness is all about in relation to a very ancient way of being when we were eliciting more of the clear 12 helix DNA. Atlantis rises at this time, the age of Aquarius provides us with this information. How specific is this arousal for you or this arising for you? Well, my, I truly, I have some incredible memories. I have a very, uh, I've been very psychic since childhood and a lot of things were very clear when I was a, a baby. I mean, my mother encouraged them in me. So I used to tell her about, I, I lived, I was from different universes and all kinds of goodies. But I do believe that I've had several lifetimes in Atlantis. And this is really something I'd like to discuss because a lot of people say, I think I had an I think I had an, a lifetime in Atlantis. I said we probably had plenty because it was a hundred thousand years of civilization, not just if you look at 20 years what's happened on planet Earth, imagine a hundred thousand years just for a kickoff. And so you may have enjoyed like I, I truly believe I did the early, early Atlantis when we were primitive and innocent, the birth of Homo sapiens, the uh, goddesses of the amethyst caves and all kinds of just extraordinary, sweet innocence. And then the progression 
peaks and valleys and that it, it's not like Atlantis was a 2000 year civilization, like let's say Rome and then, uh, sorry, Rome was great longer than that, but you know what I'm saying? Two, mm. 3000 years of civilization and then the decline. 100,000 years means up and down, up and down, up and down. And that now the great cataclysm, the, the true fall of Atlantis, we understand was the great tidal wave, the great flood. A lot of people who are spiritually oriented now have that calling, that memory. And it is unquestionable to me that a lot of old Atlanteans who saw the fall and who very possibly knew the sweet wonder of the apex of that civilization are back now because it's happening exactly the same way. The abuse of technology, the use of technology against the people, mind control, the whole bit, and that this time we've come to make sure it doesn't fall again. And I don't believe, it looks bleak, I'll be honest with you, the darkness is very strong. But uh, it had to be, if you think of it this way, Stuart, in our ease of life, the comfort of, of being comf well enough to do, especially the West, and uh, post-war, we haven't had too much sweat. Again, I'm not talking about the uh, millions of other people everywhere else in the world have suffered. But... Um, it had to be in our faces so that it wasn't just, yeah, those poor people in Syria. Yeah, bummer about Iraq. Um, it had to be in our faces so powerfully that we had to shift this thing. We had to wake up because now it's in our door. It's in our backyard. The floods, the fires, a lot of deliberate things that are going on that we have to face so that instead of being looking at, at the problems that are on this world over there. It's like, oh, oh, okay, I get it. It's everywhere. And I have to change. The world is not what it was, what I understood it to be. And <clears throat> the veil is coming down. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the ascension process. I mean, people really seem to believe that you're just going to wake up one morning, you're going to be a five-dimensional being, and you're going to sprout wings, and the next thing you know, you're off and running. And it's like, no. We've got to go through the fourth dimension, which we're doing now. We're in the fourth dimension. Looks like the third, but it's really not. And one of the clues that we know it's not is because time is completely warping, which the council, Syrianite Council, told us about 10 years ago. Yeah. And that we are faced with the karma of the entire, the entirety of civilization on this planet. Mm. All the wars, all the hate, all the destruction, and all the beauty, all the renaissance, all the wisdom, all, all in a cacophony of energy. Mm. And it's immense. Mm. It's huge. I mean, I don't know about you, but I get goosebumps just thinking about it. Yes, yes. You, but, well, you, uh, and that's you, what, when we say Atlantis rises, excuse me for, for interrupting, that's what we're talking about. Here it is again. Mm. The All of that knowledge and wisdom and fear and pain and joy and Everything is in mm. our faith. What mm. are we going to do about it? Mm. And I believe we came here to to uh, anchor the light. Mm. Of course, one of the great redeeming features of Homo sapien is the ability to think and to think with open consciousness, to be within the mental body, within the air element, and to think. But of course, we know that at the same time what's happened is another vast conspiracy since the beginning of the Age of Enlightenment where the, co the concentration moved away from the corpus of the, the anima mundi into just developing the intellect alone. And now it seems we're, you know, 450 years later, we're paying for it. Because people are living from the neck upwards. And, uh, uh, you know, I mean, wherever I'm in the United States of America, I was just talking about this with somebody else. You know, I'm hearing this, is, by the way, is not me condemning or criticizing or lampooning. It's just using an illustration to show us that we're, well, okay, to get to the core of what I was wanting to say is that we, you, you, you seem to have alluded to it a number of times in a very significant way through your beautiful expositions. 
of that feeling is the language of the soul and that we need to come back into our hearts and come back into our solar plexus to come back into our wombs so to speak and to recognize that there is something very extraordinary about the vulnerability and the fragility of the human state and that once we do this we stop running away from what we're feeling into a paroxysm of ideas and fantasies about becoming fifth dimensional people and I'm I, I, what am I going to say? What, I mean, I remember in the early 90s, I worked with the Native American shaman in New Mexico, and he would always say to me, you're good at teaching dissension. Go and teach them dissension. They all want to ascend. Because at that time in New Mexico, the Ashtar command were coming in because the whole of the planet was going to shift. <laughs> and people had actually drawn up new topography. They'd drawn up new maps. <laughs> anyway, and that we were going to literally be teleported into the motherships and we would be up there while the world was being rearranged, then we would be de deposited again on planet. So there was this level of hysteria moving around in that particular area of the United States. And the most important thing, of course, was this, that we are here to bring spirit into matter, into meta, into the mother of womb within our beings and also within the planet. I believe that you also subscribe to the same thesis, yeah? Absolutely. I love my life. I, I'm honored. I know that my soul chose to be part of this scene. And I refuse to bow down to the darkness. So as I stand in that power, it's I, I just feel like this is the great university, the great hall of learning is mm -hmm. not the halls of learning when you pass over and go through the various stages of the bardo, et cetera. But right here, this is it. This is the big challenge. Will you be grounded enough to, first of all, to love the earth instead of wanting to escape it? I mean, I do make my jokes about Scotty beam me up. I'm ready to come. But, uh, you know, I am I came with a purpose here. And I, I've, I've had an, an extraordinary life, so many gifts. And one of the reasons why is because I'm grounded. Mm. And I know that you do a lot of that work. I'm grounded. I love the earth. I, I, I believe that this is an extraordinary station in the mm. cosmos of soul. Mm. And uh, I do believe this is my last, my last lifetime, as we said privately. From Atlantis, I began this earthly journey. And mm. from Atlantis, I will, will complete it. Mm. And so, you know, I, I came for this cacophony which is a word I've already used, of energy, it's Armageddon. Mm. And I think that we make great giant leaps mm. when we stand in our sovereignty against this tidal wave and stand for the light, the power of love, and not uh, aspiring to be five-dimensional wisdom givers, but being right here honoring the body, the DNA, the soul, all creation, beauty around us, mm. and um, enjoy the ride and laugh at the dark warriors. Because, you know, I use a lot of humor. I know you do too, Stuart. And humor, it just, just like Emoto, Dr. Emoto showed us, humor just nourishes the cells. They just go berserk when we laugh. Light fill uh, wonder in the body and being. And so I laugh at the darkness. That's why when I, in, in so much of, of my work, it's like, let's look at this. Let's come on, let me see it. Look it in the face. In fact, in the book that you're reading now, I say, come on, let me see your, what, what you got. And people are like, don't you, Patricia, don't you think it's dangerous to, I go, no, that's no danger because I have no fear. Show me what you got. And this thing shrinks. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. fear that pumps up yeah. these demons. And yeah. when you look them in the eye and say, you think you, you really think you've got a, a problem with me? Show me what you got. And they just go, wah, wah, shh, and it shrivels. And what is that? But your own fear just, just dissipating. And, and, and that is the great miracle yeah. of ascension, isn't it? Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. And of course, we see it, you know, as you speak it, we see, we think of all the varying icons that we have on our planet. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in this moment about um, the deep moving of Greta Thornburg and how there she was at the age of 16, 
standing and speaking against global warming and courageously took her voice by saying, cease this, cease this. You, 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 know, you are the, the curators of the planet. I, as a child, am going to inherit this, cease this. It is taking place. Just looking into, um, oh, Steve is asking, I think you've already covered it, but just to repeat, echo it, are there significant soul, number of souls on earth that were embodied um, in, in the times of Atlantis? I don't understand the question, I'm sorry. Um, are there sig a significant number of souls on earth at this time that were embodied on Atlantis that were part I, of Atlantis? I believe so. I think that the warrior, first of all, I sort of recognize people like you that have a certain, je ne sais quoi. It's a balance of power and strength, pillars of strength and absolute consciousness of, of, of very high frequency. And I feel that this is very Atlantean mm -hmm. because we've got to be strong enough to, mm -hmm. you know, hold up those lightsabers and those shields and the experience of having been through it once before and then coming back and going, oh, okay, we got this, is uh, I think vital to yeah. the forces of light at this time on this yeah. planet that experience maybe not all of course but i think a significant number of really powerful light workers are atlanteans that have come back and i want to say there's a quality it's a warrior quality it's not airy fairy at all it's not you know sitting i'm sorry to say this i, I don't mean to offend anyone but it i'm not talking about people that are sitting on the top of the mountain uh doing mantras I'm that's not Atlantean energy. It may be Lemurian energy or, or some other kind of uh, past life worldly experience, but the Atlantean, we're angry. And that anger is having seen it be destroyed, a civilization being destroyed by abuse of power and uh, technology. And that anger has evolved into power and strength. And I feel it in certain people. I feel it in you. Hmm. It's no wonder that you're, you're working with uh, angels, hmm. Atlantean angels. No wonder at all. Yeah, and uh, having the opportunity of being able to bring all of that information into the intelligence of world leaders, thought keepers, change makers, like, for example, Diana. You know, you've. I think you received the book today, did you? Yeah. Thank you so much. I can't wait my to read it. My pleasure. And if you haven't read it, everybody, <laughs> there's another book for you to read. <laughs> yeah, we got a book for you. This balance, as you were just um, just suggesting, this balance between the yin and the yang. So the, this intense level of sensory vulnerability, but at the same time, the ability, which of course is those high points of attunement that moves us into the sacred, that moves us into feeling is the language of the soul, that moves us into our curatorship of those beautiful, that beautiful essence, which is really the initiation of our priesthood, isn't it? But at the same time, the notion of the warrior, notice that Patricia is talking about warriorship and not professional soldiery which are two very different things. Any more questions? Um, da, 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 one of my first teachers, uh, just wonderful points of coherence people are feeling. Um, da, 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 the victory of the light. Any questions, everybody? <laughs> um, because we are the... Yes, abuse of power does anger me. I feel that there's a lesson there, joyful Jennifer. I feel that there's a lesson which is, you know, that you had this experience yourself, Patricia, of being thwarted in the potential readership of your books. And of course, it stirs anger, but you actually catalyzed the anger and transmuted it into action. I'd like to say something about that. So we as spiritual people don't want to feel the lower chakras at all. We don't like those lower energies. We don't like the survival, the fear, the anger, and the emotion. We want to stay in the heart and up, or as you say, the head up. But you know what? They are vital. We need the entire system functioning completely in, harm, in harm, harmonious vibrational attunement. And 
what I like to tell people is anger is already halfway up. The next stop is the heart. Yeah. So when you feel anger about injustice, swallowing it back down and saying, no, I only want to be in, in light and love. For me personally, I, I don't know about other people, but for me, I want to feel that anger. It empowers me. I don't hold on to it, but it runs that, that chakra, that uh, vortex. Pow, pow, pow. I rise to the occasion. I'm rowdy. And I like it. And I also don't surrender. I refuse to surrender to any dogma, any authority, any, you know, even today, uh, people are doing things like uh, on Facebook, I'll say something and they'll say, That's, are you sure you want to use that word? You know, that I said something like I make, uh, here it is. I said, I make a killer ice cream. Do you really want to use that word? You could use a different word, like a delicious. Or, no, I use that word. That word is my choice of language. I am empowered to express myself as I so determine. And if it makes you uncomfortable, you need to get off of my Facebook page because I'm alive, I'm vital, I'm fiery. And that's energy. And I think we need to own it and love it and use it. And like you said, in the case when um, the publisher decided to yank my books, I was shocked. It was like a gut punch in the uh, vortex. And I sat with it a couple of days and I went, okay, okay, take them down, baby. And it gave me the strength to say, I can do this. I can republish them myself. I don't need that. Instead of, because I had a couple of friends saying, oh, Patricia, I'm so sorry. You know, don't be sorry. Be thrilled. This is an <laughs> technique for me. Be thrilled for me. Now I'm in complete charge of my work. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I want people to know that. Now, don't be afraid to feel anger or anything. Feel it, understand it, know it. You've got this incredible emotion system, uh, energy system that think back to Seth, Jane Roberts, when Seth said, I know you want to be on my side, but oh, what I would give to make love one more time to a beautiful woman or to drink a glass of Chianti or to eat a delicious steak. <laughs> I just love that. It's like, you know, on this body, you know, what a gift and feel it all, honor it all. And of course the healthy mind moves it up because you, if you stay in the anger, then you've got a problem. But yeah. you know, if you feel anger, it's just like, what can I do with this? How, how, how is this gonna move me forward? As you said, Stuart, and uh, it does. Usually yeah. I'm in love, I'm not in anger, but. Don't tell me I can't say a killer ice cream. <laughs> because there's this wonderful moment. I feel it as you speak, because as you speak it, you are authentic in the embodiment of the feeling. So there, there is the expression. We don't see you projecting the energy onto somebody else. You take full responsibility that's your energy and you emit it expressively in the way that you do and of course we all know but having fulfilled that passion just like in the love in the love making of that really beautiful orgasmic supra energy of love making there is this wonderful release where everything becomes totally still and yes. grounded and earthed and we breathe another breath and we recover from the, the fond pursuit that we've just been engaged with. And there is the zeal to do the next thing. Um, I was saying it's been a while and I'm trying to recall. <laughs> but, you know, yes, it's true. It's passion, isn't it? I mean, one thing that if I, I, I can describe about my life is I am filled with passion. I love cooking. I love photography. I Now I'm painting. I love painting. I have passion for life. Yeah. And when someone wants to convert that passion into some placid form of acceptability, I rebel. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I ask said people, feel something. It doesn't have to conform. And this is what the powers that be on this, that want to be on this planet yeah. are using against us. You can't say that. You can't feel that. That's yeah. dangerous. That hurts somebody's feelings until we're reduced to the point where we're afraid to say anything or feel anything. Because somebody's going to be offended or or we're going to be breaking some golden rule about what's uh, racist or not racist. And this is all a technique to strip us of our humanity. 
Well said. Hear, 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 hear. Is it possible those bringing in the light of the 11th dimension feel so confused and ungrounded? Um, Heather, I don't quite know what your question means. We haven't really spoken of the 11th dimension. Are you, do you feel you're channeling the 11th dimension? Um, so is it possible that, I think the word should be that, those bringing in the light of the 11th dimension feel so confused and ungrounded? Well, I mean, my feeling is that if you're open to the upper higher dimensions, that the level of clarity within one's meridian lines, within the whole of one's consciousness, is so exquisite that one is not confused or ungrounded. <laughs> I, look yes. into, I yes. agree with you. Okay. Yeah. I'm thinking of those remarkable people that I've been with, like the Bodhisattva. You know, I was called to meet Zai Baba in the early, early, early 70s. And he was extraordinary in terms of his ability to bilocate and and so forth and so forth you know the manifestations that you brought forth one of which i'm still wearing the ring that he gave me that he just plucked out of the air um and of course today his holiness the dalai lama who is such an exquisitely embodied being um i remember meeting him it's about 15 years ago now and he'd actually manifested cancer in his gallbladder and so here he was telling us this story in front of five thousand people and of course, the entire audience went, <gasps> and he burst into peals of laughter and said, what is the shock about, except in the way that his holiness speaks? And then he said, look, and he took us through the reason for why his gallbladder had become cancerous vis-a-vis -vis the expression and conduit that he was for all of the anger in, in the Tibetan people in response to the Chinese warfare and all of their moral incendiary. And he said, and so I decided to have my gallbladder removed. But within five months, I started growing a new gallbladder. <laughs> well, but there are some questions. I can't just let that ride without saying to you, there are some questions about His Holiness the Dalai Lama, like him getting on board and telling everybody to go get the Jabberwocky, which I found appalling. And, you know, he stood on, his, he sat on his throne and he advocated that everybody go get it. And I was very unhappy about that. And then of course we had the recent inf incident with the boy. So I don't know, um, I don't know about the Dalai Lama. Yeah. Um, I do have a rationale that would convert you, by the way, of going deeper into the perception of what took place with the boy and the, the, the notion you've just shared about the Jabberwocky. Unfortunately, we're moving towards a point of completion. Are there any questions you want to ask this glorious oh, lady? What a strange way to end. <laughs> I, well, let's, we're, you know, we're moving towards completion. It, it is actually an hour into our conversation. Steve, to embrace and be at peace with the lower chakras is a way of empowerment. Why would one resist? Whatever we resist persists, exactly. So well, the, the training that a lot of people understand as spiritual training is to, to stay in the higher chakras and to suppress. That's why we've got what I call the love and light people. Yeah. Uh, always be positive. Don't think of anything negative. And, you know, this is, is so, it's so disempowering. Think yeah. about what the hell you want to think about look at it understand it evaluate it feel it and transmute it transform it into something else but just avoiding it that is not spirituality in my understanding yeah yeah, yeah. well it, it's um it's psychological ghosting isn't it it's it's it not it's not living through an embodied status so what we're so as an end note what we're what you're really I mean, there are so many fine points that you're illustrating for us, but this latter point is, if we're not literally singing through each of our chakras as the databases or the biocomputers for the whole of our energy, then we're really not living an embodied status that will lead us towards this offering that is being given to us by our history, by the resolution of karma, and also as a cosmological invitation of moving into our personal sovereignty as spiritual beings having a human experience. 
there's nothing I could say to top that, I'll tell you. But I, I want to add one thing, and that is there's this new, I don't know who, who invented it, new trend that you need to get rid of your chakras. They're bad for you. And people are, are, are doing these, I swear, haven't you not heard of this? No, people, I haven't, no. These psychics that are supposedly removing their chakras. And I want to uh -huh. just say something, you know, people, first of all, you know, from a scientific or let's say a grounded point of view, the chakra system is an energy system and it, you are an electromagnetic biological unit. You have an Ida and a Pingala byway and they cross over in the Sushimi, the, in the central uh, cyst, uh, spinal cord. And those crossover points I learned very quickly when I was doing healing are where the, the chakras are. These energies uh, interact and zoom, they spin. There's no way you can remove this. This is your energy system. And if you try to remove it, you're probably going to be dead. But exactly. you know, somebody telling you you have to remove your chakras, they're bad. And please, you know, ground yourself into a, a, a knowing that yeah. that might be something you need to examine. Yeah. So when you, you know, we will have to finish, unfortunately, but as you go in this moment deep into your heart, the vision or the prayer of the way that you would will bring about a new brave new world what is the what is the impulse that arises from your heart to impart to as many people as i can that they must not bat don't want to say must not to bow down to fear fear is the is the vehicle fear is the frequency that is altering people's reality and in in doing that altering societal civilizational reality so the machine that wants to keep us terrified is is keeping that frequency in a primary position or primary level in billions of people and that we must first of all laugh they don't like us to laugh you know they really don't Everything's so serious and so dire on purpose. Laugh, just remember, and this is probably what you're waiting for me to hear. First of all, you're only in this tube for a short time. You are an immortal being. You decided to come in. You really did decide this. It was no accident. You're in this tight tube called physical reality for 70, 80, 90 years. And then out you go again, back into this brilliance of, of eternal life, taking with you the pages of your experience here. Make it beautiful. Laugh. Enjoy it. And everybody, many people, not everybody, but many people are saying, we love you, Patricia. So I feel you've communicated the core intelligence and the passion of your being. And so from the depths of my being, from the very core of my soul, I say thank you. Thank you, thank you, Patricia. And please come back on for the next installment. I love it. I really resonate with you and you're just the most delightful person. Beautiful, beautiful soul. Thank oh, by the way, we're matching in our color I, I know, Black and white. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you will agree and thank this wonderful woman as the embodied priestess that she is. I hope, you've, um, I hope you're feeling very, very different having listened to this dialogue, this deep dialogue. Please don't forget that the season begins with Patricia. And so there are now another 11 wonderful ladies that I will be meeting at this time every Monday evening for the next two and a half or nearly three months. Next week, we have the great Sheila Gillette, or Gillet. Um, Sheila, as you know, has been on before. She's my soul sister from Atlantis. I don't know if you know, Patricia, I don't know if you know Sheila. Um, no, she is an extraordinary medium, a really, really extraordinary medium, who, for example, Esther Hicks, when she began to wake up, went to for direction. And so Sheila was actually able to say, no, you're not going mad. What you're doing is enlivening yourself to being a channel. And you once were two and a half thousand years ago in the Oracle at Delphi. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget. And also, um, is there anything that you would like to mention about, I mean, obviously I, we're going to make sure that the book references are Thank underneath you. this. Is there anything you would like to mention to anybody? This is 
Do you see everybody? This is Patricia's website. Oh, thank you for that. I would just like to mention that I have republished not I, uh, after this uh, debacle with my publisher. I've gone back and republished, I think, six of my books. They're really classic literature, spiritual literature that go back 25 years and they're still as fresh as they were then. So they're now available again because they were out of stock and uh, forget it. And of course, the new book is is out too. So have a look. They're available on all the online sites. And thank you. Thank you for your love. So, ladies and gentlemen, you've received it. And also on a personal level for the community that follows the Angels of Atlantis. On September the 23rd and 24th, do not forget the weekend workshop to mark the autumn equinox. We are going to become ecological warriors. But Good. it's called the magic of the fairy kingdom, because the fairies are wanting us to become activated. And we're going to have some very unique footage that from Glastonbury, Avebury, uh, Merlin's Mound, Silbury, and also a secret location in London that is going to make everybody gasp. So <laughs> I'll be checking that out. <laughs> go to theangelsofatlantis.com forward slash events and you'll see the magic of the fairy kingdom. Bless you, everybody. Uh, please, Patricia, stay where you are. But thank you, Ryan. We'll close down. Bye-bye.